Are 15-minute cities feasible? Some urban planners say they pave the way to a cleaner, greener future. But distractors claim they threaten our personal freedom with a Hunger Games-style plan to control the population. From poorly communicated rollouts to viral online conspiracy theories, why has a simple city planning concept become a disinformation nightmare? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is 15-Minute Cities. It's not a new concept or even a complicated one. Live in a location that is a 15-minute walk or cycle away from everything you need. This will, in theory, improve your quality of life, reduce pollution with fewer cars on the road, and boost your local economy. But somewhere along the line, the innocuous-sounding plan took a dark twist. There is now a belief that this is a way for governments to control people. The narrative has caused confusion, disinformation, and some real action to prevent the plans from going forward. So is there any truth to the fears of 15-minute cities? Here's a look. Around 55% of the world's population lives in cities. By 2050, about 70% of people will be living in urban areas. And as that number increases, so too do the problems. Air pollution kills millions every year. Most people are traveling long distances even for their basic needs often stuck in traffic or packed into crowded trains and buses. Why is it we who have to adapt and to degrade our potential quality of life? Why is it not the city that responds to our needs? Urbanist Carlos Moreno started tackling these questions and developed the concept of the 15-minute city. In these cities, everyone has access to essential services like work, school, housing, leisure, and healthcare, all within a 15-minute walk or bike ride. The aim is to create green and sustainable cities with more local engagement. For that, authorities need to reduce traffic, expand sidewalks and parks, and transform existing buildings into multi-purpose spaces. Mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, used the idea in her election bid in 2020. With Moreno as her advisor, Hidalgo expanded on his Green Paris agenda during the COVID-19 pandemic. She's closed streets to cars, created miles of cycling routes, and opened schools to the community as recreational spaces. Barcelona, Bogota, Melbourne, and many other cities are also starting to adopt policies to create these 15-minute cities. But in one British city, things haven't gone to plan. Last year, the Oxford City Council endorsed the idea in its local plan for 2040. Separately, Oxfordshire County Council proposed a trial to install traffic filters on six roads in 2024 to ease congestion. They plan to issue a limited driving permit for those roads, and they could fine people who use them too often. These two plans were met with a major backlash. People linking the two proposals took to the streets, claiming the government is planning to confine them in their neighbourhoods and restrict their freedom. I do not want to live in a 15-minute city and eat bugs. No, thank you. Once it's established with digital ID and digital currency, people are going to be totally controlled by, uh, by the elite. Their discomfort was fueled by conspiracy theorists. For them, the governments are imposing climate lockdowns under the guise of a green agenda. They say traffic cameras are watching their movements, and residents will be restricted from leaving their designated zones. This dystopian plan will see roads in some of Britain's most iconic towns and cities being blocked off with a surveillance culture that would make Pyongyang envious. Like, you're no longer a productive worker, you're out of here, right? We only or, want... Or worse, like Auschwitz. While these far-out theories are gaining traction and taking up a lot of the conversation, there are legitimate concerns around this 15-minute city concept. Stand up for your rights and stop being puppets of the government! There's also a big communication problem. The council has not adequately explained changes or engaged in much public consultation. Many urban planners say a more holistic approach is needed to avoid deepening existing inequalities and social divides in the cities. They claim local participation and addressing the needs of different communities are key to having better cities. Making a space more livable is something we can certainly achieve, but we need to make sure that the amenities are up to high standards. 
marginalized neighborhoods could be landed with terrible doctors and schools. It could bring about further discrimination and inequality and territorial stigmatization. It is a difficult task to redesign infrastructure built for cars over decades and to create an equitable space for all. The 15-minute city is just one idea aiming to solve a big problem. As more and more people migrate to cities, urban planners will have their work cut out for them. So, can the concept work? Well, joining me now to debate that and the controversy around 15-minute cities are from Newcastle, UK, freelance journalist Carlton Reed. From Norwich, chairman of the Freedom Association and former conservative MEP David Campbell Bannerman. And from Los Angeles, urbanist and author of Emergent Tokyo, Designing the Spontaneous City, Joe McReynolds. Thanks all so much for being with us. Uh, Carlton, I'll start with you because you've really studied the concept and you seem to be baffled as to why there would be any controversy around what it proposes. Tell us what confounds you the most. Yes, uh, I am baffled because it is bonkers that all these conspiracy theories are bubbling up over this, mainly because many cities are already 15-minute cities, like David, where he is in, in Norwich. That's, that's definitely a 15-minute city because it's a medieval city. Uh, mm. Many, many cities were, well, in fact, all cities were created, apart from the very, very latest ones, which are motor-centric. They were all created by and for pedestrians. So a 15-minute city is just a pedestrian-friendly city where amenities are very close by. Who wouldn't want that? Right. Joe, I can see you agree, but let me ask David first. David, you are not quite a conspiracy theorist here, but you do <laughs> believe the concept could somehow hinder our freedom. How so? Well, I should start uh, by saying, uh, obviously, I think we're all agreed that good planning, you know, having local facilities so people don't have to drive big distances to get to their shops is good news. That's not really the case in Los Angeles, I know from experience. Um, but I think where, where, the, where there's a problem potentially is where um, the, the local council can actually prohibit people from traveling around or fine them. I mean, Oxford, which is uh, actually looking at this, 15 minute zones, six of those uh, for the whole city, is talking about a fine of 70 pounds uh, for car users if they travel more than 100 days a year uh, crossing the boundaries. Now, that, that's a foot in the door potentially from a freedom mm. point of view. And will it lead to um, them controlling people's movements over time? Okay, but David, I mean, come on, the congestion tax in London, what is it, $20 now or even more to drive into the city? Wouldn't yeah. that then qualify as a fine for people wanting to go where they want to go in London? Parking as well restricts freedom of movement just the same. You don't have permits to park in certain neighborhoods, you can't be there. I think uh, I, I'm aware of, you know, I've, I've driven into London with a congestion charge and that's a slightly different scheme because, you know, you, you still have the freedom to choose whether you drive in or not. And if you don't drive in, you're not charged. But if people are moving around the city of Oxford, say, um, uh, for them to be uh, actually penalised uh, for doing so is concerning. As I say, you know, it's a great idea to have local facilities and, and, and to serve people that way and have, you know, doctors and uh, schools nearby. But there is a danger that, um, uh, you know, you're going to get a lot of control. And remember in China, there's about 30 cities experimenting on this. Mm -hmm. Chengdu, I think, is one of them. And... Um, you know, we don't want a sort of Chinese-style control system arising. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I do think we need to avoid going down that road. But if you don't think it's going to happen, I mean, that's, that's to me, I don't know. It well, just seems a bit of a stretch. I, I hear a lot of well, uh, people, yeah, Joe, go ahead. I'll let you do the talking. Okay. So, yes, I am a Tokyo-focused urban studies professor. But aside from that, I work in foreign policy focused on China. I've signed the Xinjiang Initiative. I, I do a lot of work specifically on the oppression of Uyghurs in China. That isn't a 15-minute city. That's digital-enabled totalitarianism, which has no resemblance to urban policy in developed countries, uh, to, to the sort of really milquetoast 
congestion pricing and sensible urban planning that we're talking about here, you could point to literally anything in modern city design and say, well, if you took that to a totalitarian extreme, then the next thing you know, we're, we're in, in authoritarian China. I mean, that's that's just a choice to be paranoid rather than actually looking at the policy and saying, uh, here are the actual components of the policy that will have some serious negative effect. So David, even if you're not paranoid, is it at least kind of a stretch too far? I hear conspiracy theorists making that argument all the time, saying that the UK could become China, even North Korea. Well, um, the technology exists, um, and you know Cambridge is looking at this. The city of Cambridge and Huawei is based out of Cambridge, for example. You know the technology does exist, and all I'm saying is we need safeguards. I'm all in favour of good planning of encouraging people to walk, cycle, use public transport uh, within town, but. If we start going down the road of using this technology, you know, face rec recognition technology or CCTV everywhere, uh, as is, as we've seen in China, and I, I'm not saying it's and like in the, the UK, um, and in the UK, CCTV is big in the UK. That's true. Huge. But if it turned against people's freedoms or the freedom to travel. I am concerned about that. As I say, it's more of a safeguard that we don't want to go down that road. But once you've got the foot in the door, there are certain people who like to ban people using cars at all or moving around at all uh, outside their 15 minute zones. So, um, but I mean, uh, 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 and, and, and can, can I just the point phrase, out that there are certain people yeah, yeah, hold on, guys. Work in that <laughs> sentence. Like, hold on. You can find certain people saying anything on Twitter or the internet. Are there actual serious policymakers in power putting in place a plan to That is the question because cars? David, no, David so. it would be lose lose. It really would be lose lose. Politicians wouldn't win with policies like that. They wouldn't be elected for office, and it would lose money in business if you restrict people that way. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, I've been in politics a long time, 35 years, and I've seen a lot of politicians not actually doing the right thing. Sadly, uh, I, I try and do it myself for uh, the right thing. But, um, you know, as I say, there are some who are pretty authoritarian um, and do not like um, uh, these freedoms uh, of people to move around uh, freely. And um, I am concerned about the impact. So as long as that is avoided, you know, we, we can all okay. agree on good planning and uh, that aspect. I think it's the wider aspect of, well, what kind of controls are you going to exert to make this happen? OK, Car Carlton, go ahead. Sorry, I wanted to give you some equal time. What? Yeah, I was just going to say that we, the, the conspiracy theories, certainly around Oxford, they conflate two things. Um, yes, the surveillance society, everybody's worried about the surveillance society. However, here in Oxford, it's, it's not a 15 minute city that's being proposed by the local politicians at all. It's an extension of the low traffic neighbourhood, the LTN schemes, where in the city centre, there'll be certain roads will be um, restricted to motorists at certain times of the day, not not 24 hours a day. Motorists can go in and out whenever they want uh, at other times. At certain times week. of the day, at certain times in peak periods, because Oxford suffers from chronic uh, motor car caused congestion. So the, the city and local councils have been working for many years to alleviate this. The 15 minute cities thing is something that might come in many, many years. This is just a local scheme to prevent congestion and it means that motorists can get to every single point they have total freedom to go wherever they want within oxford if they go round on the ring roads mm. but not to cut through the city center this is all there is no restrictions of freedom in whatsoever in oxford yeah. what if they need to drive through town you know are you against that are you trying to ban them from their free free the freedom there of actually many Oxford, Oxford, is, is mostly, Oxford is mostly closed off right now. Even now, you, you really can't drive through Oxford uh, like you used to be able to. It's, it's almost closed off now. They are just extending it outwards okay. to, to make uh, those medieval roads a bit easier for everybody. Let me broaden out kind of the focus a little bit. Uh, Joe, I'll cross back to you because, well, like we're saying, we have, you know, things like the congestion tax uh, in the UK. In Latin America, you have what is called road space rationing, uh, both of which just stop people from driving as much. Um, that's kind of what equates to climate 
lockdown measures as far as conspiracy theorists are concerned. But the truth is, it actually does cut back on road traffic and pollution that people ultimately are happy with having improved air quality. Tell us a little bit about how it's working in, in Los Angeles when measures are taken to stop the massive congestion and smog problems in a city that size. Yeah, so I am in Los Angeles right now speaking to you, and I have work in Tokyo and research Tokyo, and the contrast between the two is fascinating because for, for the longest time here in Southern California, they focused on just widening roads, widening freeways, meaning that if you have a, a eight lane freeway, that will that will take care of it. But it turns out if you make the road wider, more people drive and you end up with the same congestion problem because people respond rationally to these incentives. Uh, t Tokyo, by contrast, uh, you actually have to prove that you have a parking space in order to buy a car and most houses don't come with parking spaces. There's no free street parking anywhere. And the end result is that you have freedom of movement, but through public transportation, uh, you have a lot more options for exploring neighborhoods and in a livable city fabric. The 15 minute city is just daily reality in Tokyo. Uh, also because the zoning allows for local shops to be in neighborhoods rather than shunted off uh, to a commercial district. Uh, so even in Los Angeles now, you're seeing a, a heavy shift uh, towards building out of public transportation networks. The stereotype of LA is this you know, smog cho choked metropolis is a few decades out of date. So we're really starting to see this, this global shift uh, from people not saying don't use cars ever, but mm. saying prioritize other uh, easy forms of transport that are that make life easier for everybody right. in our urban planning. Because one of the arguments opposing concepts like 15 minute cities is that they're trying to change our way of life. But do they have to start accepting the fact that our lives will have to change because we have a population now globally of 8 billion people. It's going to go to 10 billion people. Uh, it's going to have to be managed. You can't just dump that many more millions of cars onto Los Angeles highways or UK highways. So how do you manage the, you know, the ever increasing urban populations and the gridlock that comes with it? Uh, Joe, I'll stick with you quickly. Is that is this the way? Is this one of the solutions? Well, I, th I think in urban planning, it's it's always experimental and adaptive uh, to what didn't work 10 years ago. I mean, the 15 minute city concept, people will will try it out and they may find, oh, if your city wasn't you know designed with a medieval grid, maybe it's it's hard in practice to do a 15 minute city or maybe it only works if you also have this other thing. Urban planners are not in these hard ideological camps like mm. the the conspiracy theorists imagine. Uh, they're much more technocratic and experimental. And I think 15 minute cities are likely part of the answer. But if they don't work, then 10 years from now, we'll be trying the next thing because otherwise these problems are not going to be answered by just putting our head in the sand and pretending that the way we did things in the 60s and 70s uh, with that monomaniacal emphasis on car culture right. is going to take us to 2040 successfully. Uh, so Carlton, let me ask you, I mean, w one of the arguable obstacles to, you know, 15 minute cities is how does it really even work outside of kind of affluent areas? If you live in a poor and, and crime ridden community, even a 10 minute walk uh, is, is scary. You don't want to be walking at all any kind of distance. So how would it apply to, you know, less serviced underprivileged neighborhoods. Yeah, absolutely right. Because uh, as, as Joe would, would know from his studies, a great many of the poorer neighborhoods around the world, uh, but certainly in, in say America and in, in, in Europe, they had major highways put through them, which, which, which yeah. really, really disrupted them. And that has been a problem historically. Mm -hmm. And these sort of things are the things that we ought to be fixing. You can remove an awful lot of highways. There's a whole uh, stream of thoughts from in urban planning of actually removing highways. And lo and behold, it doesn't lead 
to, to gridlock. It actually reduces traffic for a very well-known phenomenon now called uh, uh, traffic evaporation. So uh, municipalities around the world are having to grapple with this. You are, you are quite right because mm. of congestion, clean air and health reasons. And, you know, august bodies like the, the IPCC, the, the, the UN's Climate Change Committee, has said we've got to reduce car use. We have got to reduce car use. That is undeniable. Uh, uh, so uh, the 50-minute city is one model. That's all it is. It's just a model that could perhaps uh, work for some places and other places it won't. And you're going to have to do other things, such as the highway removal, and to then reconnect communities that mm. were disconnected by all these major highways. Uh, David, let me ask you, I mean, how, how do you suggest best managing congestion, traffic, and, and the pollution that comes with it all, unless you don't think it is an issue that needs to be addressed? Oh, I do think it's an issue that needs to be addressed. I think, you know, the panelists are right in the sense, you know, congestion is a big problem, whatever city we're looking at, including Norwich. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a world of difference between charging for road space. You know, we believe, the Freedom Association believes in free markets. And essentially, you have a, a rigid good, you know, in, in road space, which you could charge more for. But so road charging, like in London, is a world of difference from fining people because they're, you know, crossing boundaries or, um, and, and, you know, the Why local council. Why is it that different? I mean, what if they just say you're going to have to pay... Uh, will tax you once you enter the city this many times, then you're going to be obligated yeah, to pay a tax. Difference. It's like Oxford is talking about a, basically a fine. If you use the car more than 100 days um, in the year, then you get fined 70 quid. If they if change that to a tax, would you accept it? Because you understand the uh, congestion well, tax. <laughs> It would be very different. I mean, if you charge for the road space, then the road user will think, well, is it worth, you know, using it at this time of day? Because, you know, London is at congested times uh, and off peak, uh, it's free in certain places anyway. But, you know, the, the, using the, the market as such, a free market to decide through price, I think is probably going to happen, well, whether we like it or not, or the road user is going to like it. But that is a very different concept to finding people because people are deciding that you're traveling too much, you know, because people do have to make long journeys to work, family, friends, hospital appointments. And I think, you know, if you start restricting that, that becomes more of a problem and you start losing it's just people. Restricting on, it's just, David, though, it's just restricting on certain roads. In Oxford, they won't find you from going to A to B, wherever you want to go in Oxford, as long as you don't use these certain very, very congested roads. Don't use those roads. Use the ring road instead. And you can go where you want, whenever you want. No fines. Cross boundaries is what I was told about Oxford. I know you're, you're you right. Can go, you says, can cross boundaries. You can go wherever you want. If you've got one point that you want to get to and another point and it crosses the boundaries, you go on the ring road and you can get to every single point. It might require a little bit more... <laughs> driving but you can get there there okay. are no fines if you want to drive around the ring road uh, joe let me ask you i mean it might sound trivial but is there an issue of, of semantics here people don't want to hear they're being yeah. fined for doing this but they yeah. might accept having to pay a tax if they want to use the roads more than everyone else yeah the charge yeah, yeah. It's, it's exactly seems to be the case. And, and this is kind of what everyone hates about modern political discourse is an idea is either socialist or capitalist, depending on who you talk to. And it's the same idea. At the end of the day, people will pay a little bit of money to take the most convenient road that's highly congested. You can call that a toll road. I have one right next to my house. I take it sometimes if I need to save time. Uh, you can call it a fine. You can call it a tax. Just can everyone please pick a term and then we can actually experiment on policies that work rather than this just endless going in circles with language. It's David, you disagree? Why? It's not the same. I mean, if a court issues a fine or the a policeman issues a fine, surely it's different from being charged like your toll road in, in L.A. I was going to ask you, actually, Joe, I mean, you know Tokyo. Tokyo has very low car ownership, is my understanding, and presumably that must affect the the number of cars, obviously, going through Tokyo, which is a huge contrast to Los Angeles, where it's almost mandatory to drive, isn't it? Uh, 
Well, that's actually a great point you bring up is Tokyo, a lot of people don't realize this, Tokyo went huge on car culture in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Tokyo is a city of water like Venice, but you don't realize it when you look at the map because they built huge highways over uh, a lot of the waterways, but then through concepts that we could analogize to 15-minute cities and things like that over a period of decades, they pulled back uh, from car culture to refocus on uh, trains and public transit mm. culture, which, as everyone knows, you know, Tokyo's oh, right. public transit is the envy of the world. If people have <laughs> never been, that's the one thing they hear about Tokyo. So they are yeah. a model of how car culture can uh, be evolved through public policy into something better over time. Let's see how uh, L.A. ever uh, adapts to, to <laughs> any of that. But, Joe, you're going to have to have the final word because, unfortunately, we're completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank... All three of my panelists, really so much for being with us. Our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter. And do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.